U.S. President Joe Biden called Russian President Vladimir Putin, and I'm quoting here, a crazy sob. The Kremlin said that such remarks debased the United States and was a quote-unquote poor attempt to seem like a Hollywood cowboy. The U.S. President made the statement during a fundraiser in San Francisco on Wednesday. He went on to say that while there was always a nuclear threat to humanity, climate change still remains at the top. U.S. Representative Mike Gallagher says, no matter who wins the coming U.S. elections, Washington's support for Taiwan will remain strong. The pro-Taiwan Gallagher arrived in Taiwan earlier today with four other U.S. lawmakers. The team of diplomats will stay in Taiwan until Saturday. Now, the visit comes as China has ramped up military and political pressure to force the democratic island to accept its sovereignty. Gallagher also met with Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen and said the U.S. delegation's trip is intended to show bipartisan support for the island. Meanwhile, China termed the visit as quote-unquote interference. The Philippines refuted China's claims over a Manila fisheries vessels intruding its waters. Manila's Coast Guard called the claims inaccurate. Earlier on Thursday, the Chinese Coast Guard said it drove away a vessel of the Philippines Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. Beijing accused it of illegally intruding into its waters near Scarborough Shoal. The Scarborough Shoal is located within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. However, China also claims the shoal, making it one of Asia's most contested maritime features and a flashpoint for flare-ups. The U.S. forces conducted four self-defense strikes against the Houthi rebels on Wednesday. The U.S. forces said they struck seven Houthi anti-ship cruise missiles and an anti-ship ballistic missile launcher in the Red Sea. The strikes were conducted between midnight till 6.45 a.m. local time. The forces also shot down a one-way attack unmanned aircraft system. Now, all the launchers and systems were identified in the Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. As per the United States, these actions will protect freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. As Israeli offensives continue to topple hospitals in Gaza, the World Health Organization has evacuated 32 critically ill patients from the Nasser Medical Complex in Khan Yunis. The patients were taken to other functional hospitals. The health organization said three transferred patients suffered from paralysis and many others had severe orthopedic injuries. Now the transfer risk, the high transfer risk rather, was a joint effort by the World Health Organization, Palestine Red Crescent and the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Some 130 patients still remain at Nasser with at least 15 doctors and nurses. An Israeli mother whose son was kidnapped during the October 7th Hamas attacks claimed a Nunra worker abducted her son. The statement was part of a news conference over a video released by the Israeli officials. The video allegedly shows a worker with the United Nations Relief Works Agency loading the body of an Israeli man in a vehicle and driving away. 
The worker recorded by security cameras was identified as Faisal Ali Musalam Alani. Israel alleges that UNRWA workers were involved in the abductions and the killings from October 7th. This prompted many countries to halt their funding to UNRWA. Egypt is denying reports of preparing an area near the Gaza border to shelter displaced Palestinians. This comes amid rising concerns over a possible Israeli offensive in Rafah. Now, Egypt has expressed fears that any offensive will force Palestinians into Egypt's Sinai Peninsula region. On the other hand, Israel said it will mount an offensive to track down Hamas's quote-unquote last bastion in Rafa. The United States, along with a cascade of countries, has denounced the decision. Over one million Palestinians have sought refuge in Rafa from the devastating Israeli offensive amid the ongoing war. On the other hand, the U.S. State Department has asked Americans not to travel to Russia over risk of detention. This comes after the arrest of a dual U.S.-Russian citizen in Russia. The 33-year-old woman is being held on treason charges pressed against her by the Federal Security Service, which is Russia's main domestic intelligence agency. In another case, a Moscow court has announced to keep a Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich in custody over espionage charges. On Tuesday, the Moscow City Court rejected an appeal against the reporter's detention. It continued to uphold an earlier ruling to keep him behind bars until the end of March. Russian President Vladimir Putin inaugurated the first international high-tech tournament in the city of Kazan. Calling it the Games of the Future, he said it is Russia's gift to the global sports family. The opening ceremony was attended by leaders from Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Teams from Russia and countries like China, India, the UK and the US will compete in the tournament. Overall, 270 teams and 2,000 athletes from about 100 countries will participate in the competition. It will include 21 innovative sports like fidgetal, football, drone racing and other disciplines combining physical culture and esports or virtual and augmented reality technology. Ukraine says only 10% of the needed aid has been funded to the war-torn country in 2024. As per the country's UN resident coordinator, Denise Brown, the lack of funds is jeopardizing crucial aid on the front lines. She said that if the agency's annual aid appeal is not met, then Ukrainians living near the borders will be at the risk of going without basic necessities like food and water. Now, as international military aid for Ukraine hangs in balance, the UN agency is repeating the urgency over the dire need for humanitarian aid in the country. The European Union Home Affairs Commissioner, Ilva Johannesson, has voiced continued support for Ukraine. She said, it is important to stand by Ukraine for as long as required. Johansson added that it was the European Union's moral responsibility to help Ukraine 
to advance on their path to join the commission as a member. Johansson, along with the German Interior Minister, Nancy Fraser, visited the Ukrainian Refugee Arrival Center in Berlin on Wednesday. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny's mother has filed a lawsuit contesting the government's refusal to release his body. She has been trying to retrieve her son's body since Saturday, following his death in prison. While the cause behind his death remains unknown, the Russian authorities have also refused to inform the family of his body's whereabouts. They said the body will be released after two weeks a delay that Navalny's team claims is for hiding evidence. Early on Tuesday, she also appealed to Russian President Putin to release her son's remains for burial. Supporters of the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange marched in London after the UK High Court concluded hearing an appeal over his extradition to the US. The court will announce whether Assange can challenge his extradition to the US on spying charges. In the two-day hearing, Assange's lawyers argued that sending him to the United States will mean a quote-unquote flagrant denial of justice. Assange has been indicted in the U.S. on espionage charges. The U.S. attorney said Assange risked innocent lives and went beyond journalism in his bid to steal and publish classified U.S. government's documents. U.S. President Joe Biden announced that his administration will cancel 1.2 billion dollars worth of student loans for nearly 153,000 people. President Biden said the debt relief will help graduates of community colleges and borrowers with small loans. As for the White House, the administration has cancelled around 138 billion dollars in student debt for about 3.9 million people. The announcement applies to people enrolled in a repayment program that covers people who borrowed $12,000 or less and are repaying the money for at least 10 years. U.S. prosecutors have said no felony charges will be filed against the police officer who struck and killed an Indian student, Janavi Kandula. The officer, identified as Kevin Dave, was driving at 119 km per hour on a street with a speed limit of 40 km per hour to respond to an overdose call. The King County prosecutor noted that the officer has turned down emergency lights and siren. The court said the 23-year-old student appeared to be running across an intersection after spotting the police car. They speculate she might have been wearing earbuds that would have compromised her hearing. Furthering the statement, the court said there was insufficient evidence to press felony charges of vehicular homicide on the officer. Brazil has blamed the United Nations and other multinational bodies for failing to control conflicts that are quote-unquote killing innocent people. The country's foreign minister, Mauro Vieira, said this while opening a conference for the foreign ministers of G20 countries in Rio de Janeiro. He said global governments, governance reforms are Brazil's top priority for its presidency of G20 the group of the largest economies of the world. Vera also slammed the United Nations Security Council for its quote-unquote unacceptable paralysis in relation to the ongoing conflicts. Separately dubbed curbing climate change and reducing poverty are also on the top agenda of the presidency.
As Brazil takes on the G20 presidency this year, foreign ministers of the countries of the group gathered in Rio de Janeiro on Wednesday. Issues including poverty, climate change and heightened global tensions topped the agenda. Now at the two-day conference, the world leaders will set a roadmap for the work ahead of the November summit in Rio. Reflecting upon the current tensions and conflicts, Brazil's foreign minister Mauro Vieira said over $2 trillion a year is spent on military budgets globally. And more of that money should go in developing aid programs. Now, earlier on Wednesday, Brazilian President met with, U met with U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken briefly to discuss global governance. Hundreds of workers from the Peruvian Workers General Confederation took to the streets on Wednesday to demand higher pay and new presidential polls. Now, the demand for a significant rise in the minimum made wage comes amid rising inflation concerns in Peru. During the demonstration, the workers said the current president, Dina Beluarte, is not recognized as president. Protesters had previously marched across Peru demanding the resignation of the president. Now, Beluarte came to power after the detention of former Peruvian president Pedro Castillo. Extreme fog sparked a massive multi-vehicle crash on US Highway 84 in southeastern Mississippi. Local media reports say at least 21 people were injured in the crash. But officials said there were no deaths. Authorities say around 20 vehicles were involved, including 18 wheelers and an overturned log truck. At least 12 people died in suspected fighting between gangs in southern Mexico. As per President Obrador, the area is witnessing a rise in violence linked to organized crime. The clashes took place in the mountain community of Las Tunas, where five charred bodies were found late on Tuesday. Security forces are carrying out an operation in the hard-to-reach area. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on Wednesday visited King Charles in Buckingham Palace for the first time since his cancer diagnosis. While undergoing treatment, the British King has postponed all public engagements. However, he is planning to continue his work including having his weekly audience with the Prime Minister and dealing with state papers. On February 5th, the Buckingham Palace announced the unspecified cancer diagnosis of the 75-year-old King Charles. The King has been on the throne for less than 18 months after the death of his mother and former Queen of United Kingdom, Queen Elizabeth. As bushfire continues to burn out of control in Australia, over 2,000 people have been ordered to evacuate from the country's Victoria state. As per reports, roughly 50 square kilometers are ablaze northwest of Ballarat, and a similar area is also burning out of control further to the west. The state emergency services urge residents in the Raglan and the Beaufort towns to leave while it still is safe. Large swathes of the state are on high alert for fires. Intel has announced plans to collaborate with Microsoft in custom chip manufacturing, aiming to surpass rival TSMC by 2025. At a San Jose event, Intel unveiled its roadmap, expecting $15 billion in foundry orders. CEO's deadline to reclaim leadership looms, fueled by government subsidies and external partnerships. 
Now, Intel emphasizes geographic diversity and partnerships with arm holdings and universities. The company's focus extends to AI with potential competition against NVIDIA. Analysts highlight Intel, Intel's pivotal shift to attract external clients as essential for its resurgence, though the outcome remains uncertain. In Japan, factory activity extended its deadline in February, with the purchasing manager's index dropping to nine consecutive months below the growth threshold. Manufacturing production shrank at its fastest pace in a year due to a significant reduction in new orders. Employment also plummeted, reflecting decreased purchasing activity and easing capacity constraints. Meanwhile, the services sector saw a slight easing in growth. These figures highlight ongoing concerns about Japan's economic downturn, compounded by recent Reuters Tankin survey showing a sharp decline in business morale. For all the latest news, download the Weon app and subscribe to our YouTube channel.